Welcome back. Today we're talking about linear models or linear regression. And we're going to talk about a simple linear model. And the reason we're going to just, just deal with a simple model is if you can understand what it is that we're asking and, and interpret the answers that, that the statistical model provides, if you can understand that for a simple linear model, then understanding all modeling becomes much, much easier. Right. So just, let, just get your head around the basics. We're not going to cover absolutely everything, but we're going to cover the essentials. And then you can build upon that quite easily. All right, you got me? Okay, let's keep going. If you want to learn about R programming, then you have come to the right place. On this YouTube channel, we're creating R programming videos on everything. Okay, as always, this forms part of a series and you can watch the playlist in actual fact. And we've started off with explore, clean, manipulate, describe, summarize, visualize, analyze. When we're in the middle of analyze now, right? And in analyze, we've done uh, the t-test, we've done ANOVA, we've done chi-squared test. And now we're going to look at linear modeling, right? Now, let's just quickly answer the question, what, what is a linear model? And, and uh, the simple art will look, if, if we look at the screen, if you look at the picture, this is going to give you, this is going to go a long way to kind of explaining what it is. Where we've got, in this case, two numeric variables. And in this case, we've got the speed of a car and the distance that the car takes to stop. So the fast, and we can see there seems to be a relationship here. That the faster a car goes, the longer it seems to take for the car to stop if it needs to stop. And that makes intuitive sense. I mean, we, like I don't think anybody would argue with that, but let's see if we can demonstrate that with the data, right? Now, what a model, a model does a couple of things. First of all, uh, we wanna test the idea that in actual fact, this, this positive relationship is real. Right, so the counterfactual, the null hypothesis, would be that the slope isn't going up, but in actual fact, there's no slope. Right, so there's no upward or downward relationship between the speed of a car and uh, the distance of a car. Remember, when we look at this picture, the x-axis here is what we call the independent variable, and the y-axis is the dependent variable. In other words, we expect, we, we, we're suggesting with this diagram, that with the change in the x variable, as, as the speed of the car changes, there will be a concomitant change in the distance that is required to stop. So the, 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 the value of the y depends on the value of x, right? Uh, and so the first thing we want to do is we want to say, look, we, we think we can see a slope here. Is that slope real? Either up or down, or is there no slope? Is there no relationship? Is there no dependence between speed and distance? That's the first thing that we can ask. The second thing that we can ask is, how much of the variation in the distance taken to stop in, in Y, how much of this up and down that we're seeing here can be explained by the change in the speed of car? Because there may be other ex explanatory variables that we don't have access to, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the reaction speed of the drivers, you know, that's something that might play into this, uh, the, 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 the kind of surface that you're on, what, what, what the car is driving on, all sorts of possibilities. But how much of this variation do we think, the, that does the model tell us, can be explained by a change in speed of the car? So that's the second, second thing that we can, we can do. Another thing that we can do is uh, we can predict how, in all likelihood, how far it's going to, what value of y we would expect for a given value in x. In other words, in this particular model, how how far how much distance is going to be required for a car to stop, given a particular speed of the car, and that's of course our line here. So we could we could take any value for x, and we could predict a value for y, knowing that it's not an accurate, it's not 100% accurate, and we can tell that it's not 100% accurate because look at all the you know all the, the red dots aren't following the blue line perfectly. There's one final thing that we can do with these models, and we are, we usually don't, but we can also predict the y-intercept. In other words, at speed zero, what would the distance be? But quite often, predicting or de determining the y-intercept, in other words, what would y be when x is zero, for quite often that's a meaningless question. You know what I mean? So in this case, a car that has stopped, there's it, it, it's meaningless to ask how much distance is required for it to stop. You understand? And and very often we've got, you know our data sort of toward the end isn't we don't have perfect data going all the way to zero. And so you'll see in this particular case it's it's just a meaningless number. We have a number, but it's it's not meaningful. So when we do a regression analysis, and, and you're going to see in a few minutes how easy it is to do it. I mean it's it's the easiest thing in the world. But what's difficult and what's important is to 
be able to, to understand and interpret the results of the, of the analysis. And the important numbers in the first instance, and, and when you do the analysis, it spits out quite a few numbers. So let's just focus on the ones that are important that answer the questions that we've been asking. Right, so it's going to give us the y-intercept, and in this case, it's going to be minus 17. We've already said that in this particular model, it's a meaningless number, but it's going to give us that number. It's also going to give us the slope. That's this blue line over here, and what the slope means, in this case, 3.9. For every one unit across on the x-axis, we move three units up on the y-axis. So for every one, and I think these are miles per hour and feet. Um, I'm used to kilometers an hour and meters, but I think that this, this particular data comes with miles per hour and feet. So for every increase in one mile per hour, there will be an increase three feet that's required to stop that car, right? And that's the slope. So that's the slope. Now, when you've got the y-intercept and the slope, you can draw the line. Does that make sense? If, 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 if you can always draw this line if you know where it crosses the y-intercept and what the slope is. You can draw the line. And so the model is essentially the line, right? So we've got a model. If we've got the y-intercept and the slope, we've got our, we've, you know, we've got the essence of our model, right? And then we can use that to predict values of y for any, for any value of x, right? Got it? Then here's the p-value. In this case, the, the p-value is extremely small, uh, 1.4. 9 times 10 to the power of negative 12, so it's you know, 0 0.000000, bada bing, bada boom. What does that mean? What is that telling us? Well, remember our hypothesis testing, right? Here we've got a slope. We can ask the question, if the slope wasn't real, let's hypothesize the null hypothesis, the antithesis, the, the, the counterfactual. If there was no slope and we took the sample of data, what is the probability that we would just by random chance, happen to find us the slope that we've found. And, and if that probability is extremely small, then we can assume that, that, that the original assumption, that in actual fact there's no slope, is incorrect, or we can reject it, and we can accept the fact that we think that the slope that we're seeing is real, or that what we're seeing is statistically significant, right? So that's how hypothesis testing works. And with a p-value this small, we, we can reject the null hypothesis that, there's, that the, the slope is zero, and we can accept the alternative that the, that the slope that we're seeing is statistically significant, right? So that gives us, and, it, and this is a very small p-value, and so we, we've got a lot of confidence that in actual fact this is a real slope. Now, you, we, when you do hypothesis testing, you have, you've got what's called an alpha value or a threshold, and that's the, th the, 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 the magnitude, like, the, how, like how small that probability needs to be for us to reject the, the, the null hypothesis, and you have to establish that before you start the test. You can't do it retrospectively. If you do it retrospectively, that's cheating. It's called p-hacking. Don't do it, right? So you need to say, what is the threshold? And then you do the statistical test, and then you determine whether or not it's statistically significant, right? Okay, so we've, we've got one last little number here, r2. Well, that's actually r squared, but it was, it, we're just writing it as r2. What does that mean, the 0 0.65? That 0 0.65 means is the proportion, so it's between 0 and 1, of the, the variation in the y in, in, in the y-axis, in the y in the in, 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 in the in, in, in these values on the y-axis, that can be explained by change in the x-axis. And if we times it by 100, it can be a percentage, right? So we can say 65% of the variation in speed in the distance taken to stop can be explained by changes in the speed of the car. All right, you got it. Okay, if you understand those four numbers, and the, a model gives you more than that, but let's that's this answers most of the questions that we're asking in the first instance. If you can understand those, you'll understand the outputs, because I'll point out where these numbers exist in the outputs, and you'll be good to go to do simple modeling. All right, you got it? Let's do it. Let's do a nice, simple, linear model. Okay, as always, people that watch my videos know that I always work in the tidyverse. The tidyverse is a package that expands the vocabulary that you can use within R. Okay, if you don't know about it, go and see my video on packages. In R, there are built-in data sets that you can use, right? Data, open and close brackets, gives you a list of data sets you can use to practice your data wrangling and data visualization. Uh, I always try to use data that you can access, so you can do what I'm doing, replicate what I'm doing at home, and that's the best way to learn, right? You got it? Okay, let's keep going, right? And in that case, we're gonna use a data set called cars, and if we go cars, head cars 10, it'll give us the first 10 values, and 
this data set has got speed and distance. You, we, you know that we're going to do this, right? You've seen the diagram already. We, this, is what we, this is the data that we used to create this visualization, right? Now, let's get going. This is how easy it is to create a, linear, a simple linear model. We start with our cars, our data set. We pipe it into LM, that's the function for linear model. Now, the arguments within that are distance by time. Distance is our dependent variable first, then uh, speed is our independent variable, x-axis, right? Distance, speed, and then we say dot equals dot. Now, why do we say dot equals dot? Because, and I've explained this in other videos, whenever you're using the pipe operator, you're piping this data set, this dot, this, this object, into the next line of code. It takes the function and it assumes that this object is being in introduced as the first argument for that function. But in the case of a linear model, as is the case with ANOVA, as is the case with the t-test. R doesn't want, this function doesn't want to see the data frame as the first argument. It wants to see it back here. So we simply tell it to pop the data in at the back over here, right? If, if, we, didn't, if we didn't put data equals dot, it would try and slot that data frame in at the beginning of this function and it wouldn't work, right? So this is just a way of telling R, use the data right at the end as the last argument in this case. Right, so we've done our linear model and then summary that summarizes the model. And if we push control enter, here's the model. Woohoo, that's easy going. The first thing that we see here is are the residuals. Now, what are the residuals? Well, it, this blue line here is our best fit line. That's the best line that we can stick through this data. Now, the blue line represents what the model says we should get for, for any given x axis, x value, what we should get as, as a y value. But you can see that in reality, our observations don't fit neatly onto that line. And the distance between the observation and the model is the residual, right? And so you, a good model, a good fit, is that there isn't much residual. In other words, all of these little dots are very close to the blue line, and a badly fitted model is where the, the dots are all far away from the blue line, right? So these are your residuals. Uh, and they, so your residuals, those are numbers, that there's a distribution of those residuals. And what you want, if your model is valid, is for those residuals to be pretty much symmetrically uh, distributed around zero. So what do we see here? Our, our, our interquartile range is reasonably well, uh, relatively well, uh, well placed around zero. We're going to come back to residuals, and I'm going to show you how we can look at that a little bit more closely uh, in, in just a minute. But this is these are your residuals, and you, 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 you're going to use those to just try and determine the strength of your model, right? Next thing, you've got these coefficients, and the two that I want you to see are here, these estimates, right? Now, it doesn't call, it, it says intercept. Well, that's correct. That is the y-intercept, and we've said, we've already said that in this particular model, that's really meaningless. We, we, we don't care what it is, but you need an intercept if you're going to have a model, right? There needs to be some way that theoretically this crosses the y-axis. Uh, in this case, the intercept is minus 17. You can't have minus 17 meters, so can you see how the intercept in this case in real life is meaningless, but you need it to create the model, right? So we've got the number, but ignore it. But the other co uh, the other coefficient, this number here next to speed, that's the slope, right? So we've got that over here. That's the slope, and that's the thing that we're going to use to predict y values as a function of x, right? So we've got the slope, and we've said that for every movement along the x-axis, we move 3.9 units along the y-axis, right? So that gives us a slope. The next value that I want you to see is right over here. This is the p-value for our slope. And remember, that's where we were saying the null hypothesis is that the slope is zero. We seeing a slope of 3.9. The probability of getting a slope of 3.9, if it were the case, if it were the case that in actual fact, at a population level, the slope was zero, the probability would be extremely small. 1.49 times 10 to the power of negative 12, in, like terribly small. Importantly, that number is smaller than our, our alpha, our threshold, which is 0.05, or you could, you could have any alpha. There's reasons for having different alphas. And so we reject the null hypothesis that the slope is, is zero, and we accept that this is statistically significant. And then the last number I want you to look at here is the R squared down here, right? That's, that number is the one that tells us it's 0.65 or 65% of the change in Y can be explained by a change in X. We've got the adjusted R here, and it's very similar in this case, but the reason there's an adjust, you don't need the adjusted R squared, by the way, uh, for a simple linear model. But as if we had a, a multivariate linear model, regression model, we would 
start looking at the adjusted squared instead of the R squared, and it will adjust for the fact that there's more than one variable. Okay, that's just so that you know that. And the F statistic also is more important when you've got multiple variables, and it tells you the extent to which the overall model is, is, is a good fit, whether this is a good model or not. But it becomes more and more relevant as we start adding variables on. But these four numbers here are the, are the they, these are the ones that you absolutely need to understand, and you can build upon that as you get to understand linear modeling better and better. Okay, let's just go back to our code for a second. So we did all of that just by going cars, pipe it into model, getting the summary, right? But let's just look at other ways of doing the same thing and, and other things that we can extract here. We can take this line, okay, linear model, uh, distance speed, and without piping it in, we'd actually have to say what data we're looking for. So data equals cars, right? And we assign that to MOD. You could assign that to anything, but we're just going to call it MOD. We're creating an object. All right, so if we do that, we're creating an object called MOD. And if we call that object, if we control enter on that object, um, it doesn't do the entire summary that we got earlier. It just gives us the intercepts. But if we ask for summary of MOD, summary of model, then it's going to give us the whole model, the same thing that we got earlier with this, this that code up there. All right? The nice thing about creating the object MOD, when we create that model, is there's more we can do with it, right? So we can say attributes MOD, right? Attributes MOD, and it'll tell us all the things that sit inside that model. And then we can call specific ones that we want. Like if we want to look at all of the residuals, for example, we can do MOD dollar sign residuals, and voila, it's going to give us all of the residuals. That's interesting, because what if we then said hist, to get a histogram of MOD dollar sign residuals, we can draw a histogram of our residuals to determine whether or not we believe that it is symmetrically uh, shaped around zero, for example. And I'm not going to get into, you know, the, whether whether or not this is exactly symmetrical or not, but you understand the idea that you can call your residuals and then you can start asking questions about that. All right, the next thing that's uh, quite fun and quite important is we can now actually use this model to do some of this predicting, right? So it's not just like in theory we can predict stuff. I mean, we can actually we can actually do this prediction. All right. Let's say, for example, we generated a list of speeds, right? We call them new speeds, speeds that we want to we we we, we want to we. These are x-axis. These are independent variable uh, data points, and we need to put them into a data frame. So we say data frame. Uh, and we're only going to have one variable in this data frame. It's going to be speed, and speed is going to have these three values, right? So we create that new object speed, and if we click on it, we can see what it looks like, and there you see it's a little data frame. It's just got one variable, that variable speed. Fine. Super duper easy. Now, we've already got an object called mod. That's our model. So we can use the function predict. The first argument is mod. That's the model. The second argument is our new values that we want to plug into the model. And then I'm just piping it into the, the function round to round off the numbers, right? And if we push control enter, voila, we can see down here. For the first value, which was 10, the model predicts that your stopping time, that your stopping distance would be 21 meters. So if you were so the model predicts that at 10 miles an hour, it would take 21 meters, about 21 meters to stop. Let's look at the diagram. At 10 miles an hour, if we look at the line and where does that map out onto you onto your y-axis yeah probably about somewhere 21 meter uh, feet to stop similarly the second value 15 uh, gives 41 meters 15 zoop, and that's about 41 and the third is 61 from 20 20 goes up to about 61 so it all works out exactly as we would expect just to show you if we go back to our code here we can get to the same place with our pipe operator so we start with car pipe it into our model, right? Pipe that into predict. So the first argument here in predict is going to be the model that's piped in. So we don't need to say MOD. We're piping the model in. In the second instance, we, we're not going to use, we could stick in the new speeds, but we could actually create that data frame inside the predict function, right? So we're just going to stick all of that in there and then pipe that into round. And I won't round it off to one decimal place now. I'll just round it off to none. And there you go. We've rounded it off. There's your values. Okay. Now the next video is going to be about how to use R Markdown to, to use R to output Word documents, PDFs, or even web pages. Okay. Super duper exciting. 
subscribe to this channel if you haven't already hit the bell notification if you want notification of future videos don't ever change don't do drugs always do your best remember to share this video with people that you think might find it interesting and stay and watch another video okay take care bye